So in the previous segment of this lecture, we talked about mental modules. I said there are different kinds of modules, and I said there's a particular kind of module that we're looking for. We're looking for modules that aren't just tools, like the blades in a Swiss Army knife, but are, in a sense, command modules. That is, they could, they could take control of the mind for at least a while. Uh, because if there are such modules, that would help explain how the mind could operate effectively without there being a single unified self in control. The idea is that there might be a number of these command modules and they would kind of take turns running the show. Well, I've got good news. I have found such modules, or at least I've found somebody who says that he has found such modules. His name is Douglas Kenrick. He's a psychologist at Arizona State University, and in 2013, he co-authored a book called The Rational Animal, which puts forth a modular view of the mind, a modular model. And the book argues that when it comes to our social behavior, we're pretty much always under the influence of one of seven modules that uh, Kendrick and his co-author call subselves. Now, subself is an interesting term. Uh, the prefix sub, of course, means under. So this might suggest that there is one unified self at the top of the hierarchy, and it determines which of the seven modules or subselves is in charge at any given time. It delegates authority. Well, it turns out that actually that's not what Kenrick meant to convey by the term, as became evident in an exchange I had with him recently. With these subselves or modules, or I might view these subselves as almost kind of mega modules or meta modules because they yes, mobilize they a lot of smaller modules, They're right? Higher level modules, but I'd say that's as high as it gets. There isn't another one at the top. There isn't a another kind of decision. There isn't like a president in charge of all this. Right. All there are are there's there's uh, you know a secretary of state and a secretary of warfare right? and a right. secretary of you know mating. Okay, so Kendrick says these modules are like cabinet secretaries. That raises at least three questions. First of all, what are the seven cabinet positions? What domains are these modules in charge of? Second, what determines, if there is no president, what determines which module is in charge at a given time? And third, what difference does it make which module is in charge? What exactly are the changes in behavioral and mental disposition that different modules usher in? Well, as far as the first question goes, you know, what are the seven cabinet positions? Kenrick is an evolutionary psychologist, so he approaches this question from an evolutionary point of view. And he says, well, basically, in the realm of social behavior, there are seven main kinds of challenges, in his view, that our ancestors had to meet in order to get their genes into the next generation. So you would expect natural selection to build a mind that attends to these seven areas of challenge, and that's how he comes up with his list of uh, seven modules. First, there's a self-protection module, which indeed would be a valuable thing from natural selection's point of view. In other words, the ability to fend off harm if other members of our species want to harm us. Um, second, if the object of the game is to get genes into the next generation, it would help to be able to attract mates. It would also help to be able to hold on to mates. Um, and then there is what uh, Kenrick and his co-author called the affiliation module that has to do with making friendships, cementing alliances, and so on. There's the kin care module, in other words, taking care of other people who share a lot of your genes. That makes sense in terms of natural selection. Uh, there's the status module. Certainly people do seem inclined to seek status and to display status, and it, that does seem to have been correlated with getting genes into the next generation during evolution. And then there's a kind of anomalous module, um, the disease avoidance module, which just means, you know, basically staying away from people who seem to carry germs. Now, I want to emphasize this is just one possible modular view of the mind. Um, it's not a consensus view among people who take a modular view of the mind, uh, but it does make sense as a basic division of mental labor, and it certainly gives us something to get a handle on in terms of just thinking about these modular models of the mind. Now we can look at specific proposed modules, ask how they would work, and see how valuable this kind of model actually is. So let's focus on the first two modules, self-protection and mate attraction. 
And let's ask the second and third of those three questions I just outlined, okay? Second question is, what is it that determines which module will be in charge at any given time? Now here I think Kenrick's answer is pretty much the answer that you would get from a lot of people who subscribe to a modular view of the mind. The basic idea is that whichever module is most highly activated by information in the environment will tend to become dominant for some period of time. So one example is, if somebody is running towards you waving a machete saying I'm going to kill you, then that would, you know, the self-protection module would kick in and you might start running away and screaming help, help, help. That's a pretty straightforward example of a module becoming highly active and then dominant and kind of controlling your behavior. In fact, it's such a straightforward example that you might ask, wait a second, do we really need all this fancy module talk? I mean, I've, I've always known that fear makes people do things like run away. How much value is really added when we, when we call this thing a module? Well, it's a good question, but I would ask you to just reserve judgment and see how far we can uh, go with, these, with this model and see what it looks like after we flesh it out um, a little more. For now, let's move on to the third of the three questions. What difference does it make uh, which module is in charge? How does a module change our behavioral or mental disposition? And here I think what's interesting is how subtle some of the changes can be. And this came through in an experiment that Kenrick did along with a number of uh, collaborators. One thing they were looking at in this experiment is how do people respond to advertising? They, they created an ad for a museum and they created two different versions of the ad with two different taglines. One of the taglines was visited by over a million people each year and the other tagline was stand out from the crowd. Now those are two very different angles um, that you would think might appeal to different kinds of people. But one question that Kenrick and his, and his collaborators were interested in was, well, could you change um, which ad pitch will appeal to a given person by changing which module is in charge at that moment? So they came up with a way of activating either the self-protection module or the mate attraction module. They showed people scenes from one of two movies, either a scary movie, The Shining with Jack Nicholson, or a romantic movie called Before Sunrise. Then after the people had seen parts of one of these two movies, then they saw the ad and then they were asked questions like, well, how inclined would you be to visit this museum? And it turned out that people who had seen the scary movie were more inclined to visit the museum when they saw the tagline visited by over a million people each year, um, perhaps because, you know, there's safety in numbers. Uh, so if your fear module is activated, if Jack Nicholson is chasing you with an ax, you'd rather be around a lot of people who might be able to help. Um, but in any event, that was the finding. And it turned out that seeing the romantic movie inclined people to go for the tagline, stand out from the crowd, which could be because when we're in courtship mode, we're trying to distinguish ourselves from other people. Um, could also be because when we're in courtship mode, in mate attraction mode, we are looking for an intimate environment to be alone with the person. Um, but in any event, what's interesting here is that here's something that you might think is a more or less fixed part of a person's uh, personality. In other words, they're going to go for one tagline or the other. There's two kinds of people and I imagine that's the way advertisers might think of it, that these two ads would appeal to two different kinds of people. But no, it turns out that actually uh, it, each, each ad can appeal to one person. It just depends on which you you are at the moment. It depends on which module is in charge at the moment. Um, now there was another experiment that, that looked at a very similar idea. In other words, it looked at something we might expect to remain pretty constant and then, and then it examined how you might actually make it, make it change. Um, and this, is, uh, this involves something that economists call a uh, time discounting rate or a future discounting rate or in even more technical terms, an intertemporal utility function. What this refers to is your willingness to forego reward in the short term for a greater reward in the future. So if I say to you, look, you can either have $10 today or you can have $15 in a month, which do you want? 
How you answer this question and other questions like that determines what your time discount rate is. And economists have long said that, you know, people will, different people will have different such rates, but the models of economists have tended to assume that any given person's time discount rate would remain a constant, you know, from day to day and week to week. Well, that turns out not to be the case, and one way we know is because of an experiment that was done by uh, Margo Wilson, who was a very important figure in evolutionary psychology and passed away a few years ago. Uh, and she did the experiment along with her longtime collaborator, Martin Daly. And what they did is they took uh, men and they showed some of them pictures of women who had been judged as attractive on one of these websites where people go and judge men and women as either uh, hot or not hot. Um, and uh, they showed other men pictures of other things, either women who hadn't been judged as attractive or pictures of men or pictures of cars or whatever. And it turned out that when men had seen these pictures of attractive women, they were then more inclined than they otherwise would have been to uh, want their money now, to not be willing to forego immediate uh, reward for a greater reward in the future. And the kind of con commonsensical evolutionary explanation of this is that, you know, when the mate attraction module is activated, when you're in courtship mode, you want to put on a display, you want to have all your resources there to show off in front of um, the woman. Now, uh, this, you know, if this is the strategy, it doesn't seem to be orchestrated at a conscious level. Uh, because remember, they're just looking at pictures of attractive women, and, and there's no way they would think consciously, I'd certainly like to impress this picture of a woman whom I will never actually meet. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, and the fact that the mere picture of a woman does trigger this kind of strategic response reminds us that we were designed by natural selection for an environment that's different from the current environment. In other words, it was an environment in this case um, before the invention of photography. So during evolution, if you ever saw a, an, an image of a woman, there was a real woman there. So our, our, our minds are designed to, in some ways at least, respond to uh, images of all images of women as if they were um, real women. Now, there was another experiment where a feature that you might think is a pretty more or less constant property of a person's mind um, turned out to change in response to the activation of the mate attraction module. In this experiment, psychologists took high school males and they had them fill out a survey about their career aspirations. Some of them filled it out in a room full of other males. Some of them filled it out in a room uh, that included both males filling it out and some females filling it out. Um, and it turned out that the, the boys in the room that included girls their age were more inclined to have more ambitious career aspirations and in particular to, to rate income, making a lot of money as an important goal associated with their aspirations. Now, I doubt that this was some kind of enduring change in their actual aspirations. It could well be that what was happening was that their minds were being prepared for a kind of self-advertisement, a kind of display. In other words, in the event that they wound up talking to the females in the room, they would be all prepared to talk about how they were going to conquer the world and make lots of money and so on. But if that indeed was the strategy, it, it, it doesn't seem to have been a conscious strategy because after all, the surveys they were filling out, the girls weren't going to see and the girls couldn't see uh, the surveys from where they were. Um, and moreover, the, these, uh, the people in the experiment had been told not to talk to one another, so there wasn't even the prospect of talking to the girls in the, um, in the short run. So again, this is a case where uh, this doesn't seem to involve conscious orchestration of, of, of a kind of uh, strategy. There's no conscious decision to um, usher in a particular module, and yet it happens um, nonetheless. By the way, in both of these last two experiments, the experiments were performed not only on males, but also on females. But the, the effect in question was not found in the case of the females. Um, and that's in keeping with the view in evolutionary psychology that when it comes to kind of romantic psychology, sexual psychology, 
there will be some differences between, between men and women. Um, you could have just as easily done experiments that would highlight distinctively female uh, features of the mate at attraction module. It just so happened that these focused on male features. Okay, so we've seen three things that you might think would be more or less constant features of a person's personality and wouldn't, wouldn't change a lot. Um, what kind of ad pitch they respond to, what their career aspirations are, and what their time discounting rate is. But in all three cases, uh, there can be significant change in these without uh, some kind of conscious self um, deciding to make the change. Now, you might look at this and say, you, you, you still might ask the question, do we really need all this module talk? Can't we talk about these people just being in, say, a romantic mood? Well, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I doubt that the, the people who were taking the survey, the guys who were taking the survey in the presence of the girls, uh, were really entering what we normally call a romantic mood, and I doubt that was true of the guys who were shown the pictures of the women. Um, I am of the view that there is probably some change in affect, some change in feeling that is associated with these shifts of module. But I don't think the, the word mood is going to always be appropriate. Another reason that I think um, the term module makes sense is because, you know, we're talking, when you add it all up, we're talking about a, a kind of diverse array of changes in our very mental orientation, our frame of mind, um, and that includes our, our perceptual framework. Because if you remember from the first lecture, we talked about an experiment in which uh, first uh, psychologists showed people a uh, part of a scary movie, in this case it was Silence of the Lambs, and then they showed them pictures of males uh, in a different ethnic group, and these were uh, facial expressions that had been judged as neutral by objective observers, but the people who had seen the scary movie um, judged the, the faces to be threatening and angry or so. So our very kind of perceptual field is, is changed when, when modules change. Now, I don't want to oversimplify here. For, for one thing, uh, we should keep in mind that there are always going to be individual differences. You know, different people are different, and whenever you hear the results of any psychology study put in this form, uh, condition A leads people to exhibit behavior X, and condition B leads them to exhibit behavior Y, well, that is an oversimplification. We're always talking about a statistical generalization. It isn't the case that everyone who saw the scary movie went for the ad pitch uh, visited by over a million people each year. You know, different people's modules will be activated by somewhat different things and also will play out somewhat differently in the effects that they have. Uh, there's another sense in which I want to be careful not to oversimplify, and that is just that as these models get fleshed out, there are a lot of, of subtleties and, and wrinkles and paradoxes that are going to, to have to be ironed out. I mean, for example, um, in, in, the, in the model we've been describing uh, in, in the book that uh, Doug Kenrick co-authored, uh, they have these seven modules, uh, and one of them is the status module. And, you know, when you think of it, the, the, the status module is probably going to be activated in the context of other modules. In other words, if you're in mate attraction mode, you may well do some kind of status display. For that matter, when you're in affiliation mode and you're trying to impress people so that they'll become your friends or whatever, you may engage in a status display. So you have to ask, well, what's going on here? Are we rapidly vacillating back and forth between two modules? Or is it the case that one of these seven main modules can become, in effect, a sub-module of another of the main modules or what? These are some of the questions that will have to be addressed. Um, also, uh, it is the case that, that when a module does have a kind of a sub-module that it employs as a, as a tool, uh, the effects can be kind of paradoxical in, the, in this sense. You know, you might think that the affiliation module, being all about friendship, would involve, you know, patting people on the back, saying nice things to them, uh, cementing your friendships. But an evolutionary psychologist might argue that actually one of the uh, tools employed in the process of regulating a friendship 
is, is anger, the emotion of anger, or you might say the, the module uh, that anger entails. Um, and this, this subject came up recently in a conversation I had with Lita Cosmides. Um, she was a pioneering figure in the early days of evolutionary psychology. Uh, and she is as responsible as anyone, I would say, for convincing people in evolutionary psychology that a modular view of the mind really made sense from an evolutionary point of view. And here's how, how this part of the conversation went. Uh, we've been doing research with Aaron Sell about this. Um, and uh, coming out of a theory that anger is triggered when somebody does something that makes you realize that they're putting much much too little weight on your welfare than you think you're entitled to as a function of the kind of relationship you have with the person. But when that is triggered, when the anger towards that person is triggered, um, certain things should happen. Because if anger is a system that's designed for interpersonal bargaining, for trying to get the other person to put more weight on your welfare in the future, then um, you should have certain motivations to communicate certain things to the person, like you imposed a really big cost on me. You may not think you did, but you did. Mm -hmm. um, and you did it for a small benefit to yourself. How could you do that? Um, I've been a very good cooperator with you. I've been a good friend to you. I've done a lot of things uh, for you in the past, which is an uh, expression of, you know, that I deserve to be treated better than you were treating me. Now, to further complicate things, when you think about it, um, a friendship isn't the only context in which the anger module uh, might be deployed. Um, people get angry at, at their mates, at their romantic partners, and that kind of makes sense uh, if indeed the, the terms of a relationship might be renegotiated from time to time. So um, it, it would be mistaken to think of, of what Kenrick calls the mate retention module as being all about buying roses and giving foot massages uh, and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, there's another example of that, which is jealousy. You know, from an evolutionary psychologist's point of view, jealousy is a functional thing that, that comes into play. Um, and Lita Cosmetis uh, talked with me about that as well. We've evolved superordinate pro programs that solve the problem of shutting down certain mechanisms and activating other mechanisms in ways that are very well coordinated for solving a particular adaptive problem. And sure, you can think of sexual jealousy um, that way. I mean, the idea is that it would shift your attention. You're suddenly going to be paying attention to things like simultaneous absence. You know, if your spouse and the person you suspect are uh, both not here at the same time, that's going to seem, no, usually we don't notice simultaneous absence. Right. Most people right. in the world are absent right now. Um, I, I, don't, I don't notice that. <laughs> it's going to focus your attention in different ways. You're going to have um, episodic memories. You're going to retrieve episodes from the past where, huh, if you were a man, huh, she got really dressed up at that for that party. And she usually doesn't do that, but he was going to be there. What's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you start reevaluating past uh, episodes. So there's memory retrieval functions that are changing. Inferences are, are changing about what, what people's behavior means. It might be goals that are activated for mate guarding, for keeping track of where your spouse is and what they're doing and who they're talking to. Um, and it's very hard to, to shut that off. It's very hard if you have to study for a calculus test to do that when your whole sexual jealousy system is activated. By, I would say by design. And it doesn't mean that you're not thinking or not processing information. It's that you're processing information in a particular way that's well suited for solving that adaptive problem. And part of that emotional state is to deactivate other kinds of adaptive problem mechanisms that are designed for other kinds of adaptive problems. So in sum, it's all very complex. Any model that's going to be able to do justice to the human mind, which is after all a very complex thing, is, is bound to um, ultimately have to accommodate a lot of complexity, and I think that's what we'll see as these models evolve. Um, but the main thing to keep in mind, and this applies regardless of whether you buy the module language per se, or whether you'd rather talk about these things as systems or modes, or even in some cases just moods in, and emotions, the main thing is that what we're seeing is that very significant changes in our state of mind, our behavioral disposition, can be ushered in without our consciously choosing to change our state of mind. Now we've long known this, 
about things like jealousy and anger. You know, it's kind of obvious that these things just kind of seem to seize control sometimes. But I think we're going to become more and more aware of what um, subtle changes can be ushered in without our actually choosing them. So, uh, for example, when, when the people came out of that movie, the people who had seen the romantic movie and then chose one of the two ad pitches, it's a pretty subtle uh, change of mind, uh, but I don't think they, they consciously chose to flip the switch on some new module and probably weren't aware, in fact, that a change in disposition had actually happened. So it, it's looking very much like um, the kind of conscious mind isn't very often choosing what frame of mind we're in. And this too came up in my conversation with Lita Cosmides. You don't choose the module, the module chooses you almost. You know? right, right, except that what is the you anyway? Now, when Lita expresses skepticism about the idea of a you, um, she's speaking from a kind of evolutionary point of view, because from that point of view, it's not obvious why the mind would consist of anything other than modules, right? Because if you ask, well, how did we get from being one-celled creatures, which our distant ancestors were, to being human beings, uh, the answer is we evolved, uh, and we evolved nervous systems, and in particular, we involved a part of the nervous system known as the brain, and the brain evolved in increments, in bits and pieces and chunks, um, but according to the theory of natural selection, every significant chunk, every increment, you know, evolved for a, a reason. Um, generically, the reason is that it helped us get genes into the next generation, but there was a more specific reason as well. Um, you know, the, the idea is, is that this part of the brain would help us attract mates better than the average member of our species or help us take care of our offspring better than the average member of our species or help us make friends or protect ourselves or whatever. And from an evolutionary point of view, you know, that's what the whole evolution of the mind consists of, the accumulation of these functional units, these things you can call modules, and it's not obvious why at any point something that you would call a you would, would suddenly show up, um, something that you would call a, a self as it's commonly conceived. Um, in any event, with Lita's skepticism about the you, you know, we are, we are getting back to the Buddha, who of course had a similar skepticism. Uh, more specifically, if you remember his uh, discourse on the not-self, uh, there were two themes in particular that he emphasized. First of all, he seemed not to see how you could claim that there was some kind of coherent self that persists through time. There seemed to him to be too much flux, uh, too much impermanence. And a modular view of the mind uh, helps explain why that would be. Uh, because there is no single coherent self. There are a number of, of what you could call sub-selves or modules or whatever that kind of take turns running the show. Uh, the other big theme in that discourse was the Buddha saying, look, if you think um, you have, you know, conscious control of very much of what's going on in your mind, um, you know, I think you're wrong. And the modular view uh, helps explain why that would be the case as well. Because our state of mind at any given time is not, generally speaking, the result of conscious choice, but rather it's the result of how the information in our environment uh, comes into our minds and, and at, at, a, at a typically unconscious level um, shifts our frame of mind. Okay, so this very important part of Buddhist doctrine makes a lot of sense uh, in, in the context of the modular view of the mind. Um, and in the next lecture, what we're going to talk about is how the modular view of the mind helps make sense of Buddhist practice, in particular meditation, and more specifically mindfulness meditation. We're going to ask whether a modular view of the mind helps explain what's going on in the course of mindfulness meditation and why it works the way it does. We're also going to continue to flesh out the modular view of the mind. For example, uh, we're going to ask, uh, is it the case that there can be conflicts between two modules if they're both kind of strongly activated, 
Um, and might this explain uh, why we sometimes have issues of self-control, have trouble controlling the appetites? Um, and if so, what rules, uh, if any, ultimately determine which module wins? And we're going to ask whether mindfulness meditation can actually change the rules about which module wins. So in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the modular view of the mind and mindfulness meditation.